who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So there was this one Sunday as they were driving home from church, a couple a woman asks her husband, Do you think that Mrs. Smith is dyeing her hair? I didn't even see her, her husband admits. And that dress that that one woman was wearing, she continues, really, don't tell me you think that's proper outfit for a woman of her age. I'm afraid I didn't notice that either, her husband said. Well, for heaven's sakes, the woman says, a lot of good it does for you to go to church. <laughs> That's kind of what the picture that we're going to be talking about today is. It's about worship. And when we use the word worship here, we're using it, it's used in various different ways. But when I use the word worship this morning, it's about the religious activities that we're doing. This morning, what has a church? It's the stuff like, like the prayers and the singing and the preaching and all of this stuff. When we're doing those things, I mean, that's why we're here, right? Yes. So you don't sound real confident about that, but I'll, by the end of the sermon, maybe you'll be more confident about that. But the reality is, is that in a lot of times, sometimes people come to church for other reasons. They come for maybe a selfish reason, or they come just to see what other people are doing. And what the, what Amos is going to be doing this morning, as we look at his, um, as look at his preaching, is the idea that there's a lot of religious activity going on in this world, but it's not very profitable for people. People aren't really doing these things for the right reasons and in the right ways and the right for the right purpose. And trying to look at all of these different things, we just kind of it's just easy to come to church and wonder if God is even there. And, and the kind of the idea would be is why would God come to church if we're not worshiping? in the right way. Why would God be here if we're coming just to look at other people or just to, I don't know, make uh, make some kind of observation or just, you know, we're not coming here to participate. One per, another uh, famous pastor, um, if I can find it, his, his, uh, his name is James Kennedy, said, most people think of the church as a drama. He said, with the minister as the chief actor, God as the prompter, and the laity, that's you, as a critic. What is actually the case is that the congregation, that's you, is the chief actor, the minister is the prompter, and God is the critic. God looks at us and says, well, what, what about you this morning while you're here? It's really worshiping God, worshiping you. And do you realize that God is here listening to you and listening to the words that you're saying, but at the same time, he knows what you're thinking. And if those two things don't line up, God knows it. God knows it. It's not just what you're doing while you're here, too. It's Monday through Saturday. That God looks at those things, too. And sometimes he looks at those things and says, well, what you're doing for those seven days are not really the way that you're doing things on Sunday. And that affects this whole concept of what it is, what are we doing when we worship? So, one of the things I want to remind you of, and I'm going to, I'm going to remind you all the way through the Minor Prophets, is in, from Matthew chapter 22. This is the, the number one most important thing, Jesus says. In one sense, if Jesus was going to say, here's the, the main thing is the main thing, and what's the main thing? Here's the main thing. 
How many times can I say main thing in one sentence? Six times, main thing. But when he's asked to, when he's asked to what the greatest commandment is, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And that's something that you're supposed to do, not just at church, but every day, all day long. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this at the end. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. So when Amos is preaching to us, Jesus says, Amos is trying to get across this commandment in, in his own individual style, in his own individual way. He is applying this to the people that he's talking to. You are to love God and love your neighbor. And, and, and this has been my kind of theme verse all the way through as, we, as I decided to go into the minor prophets and go through all these. Because a lot of the minor prophets are kind of negative. He spends a lot of time telling people, basically, you're not doing this. You are not loving God. You are not loving your neighbor. And so he's, and because of that, a lot of what he's saying sounds really, well, negative. And we don't really, we, we live in a culture, we don't really like negative things. You ever heard that thing where you say, before you say something negative, you have to say two positive things? You ever heard that? Or if you say something negative, you got to say, I mean, that's a, that's a theory that people have. But Amos doesn't do that. He spends nine chapters telling people how terribly, how terrible sinners they are. <laughs> if I did that, the only person here would be, Carol, and she'd only be here because she's married to me. So what am I, what is she going to do, right? So we're going to talk to Amos, and just to show you what I'm talking about, Amos chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We read this one last week, but I think this is a really interesting verse. These two verses together. And Amos says this to his, the people of Israel. Hear this word, the word of the Lord. Have spoken against against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. And verse 2 says, You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. I feel good about that. God has chosen me. Therefore, I will love you all the more. <laughs> Whoa, that's not what he said, is it? You're my people. You're my family, you're my children, therefore I will punish you for all your sins. That is a, that's not where he thought he was going with that, right? And that's the, the thing that Amos has to do. That's what the prophets do over and over and over again. I've chosen you. I expect something from you. I expect a certain lifestyle. I expect a certain attitude. And Jesus sums that up by saying, what I expect from you is that you will love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and that you will love your neighbor as yourself. One of the problems, like this is a, this, I'm going to give you this for free, I'm not going to charge you for it, but one of the problems is in the church today, and one of the reasons why there's a lot of divisions is because there's these two aspects to this commandment, love God, love your neighbor. Well, there's lots of people who, oh, they don't have any problem loving God. But I'm not so sure I really want to love my neighbor, right? I mean, or that, that doesn't become a real focus. I love God, love neighbor. But there are a whole set of other Christians, other believers, who are all kind of exactly the opposite. Oh yeah, I'll spend a lot of time helping my neighbor, loving my neighbor, caring for the needy, doing all that. But love God? Eh, I'm not so sure that I need to do that. And so this is what Amos keeps coming back to. Now part of the, and one of the things that happens in each one of the prophets is there's kind of an emphasis on one or the other. The emphasis for Amos is more on the love your neighbor part. It doesn't mean that he ignores the love your God. It just means that's the emphasis. Remember Hosea a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago? Hosea was the opposite. He was focused on the love your God part. And the love your neighbor was there, but it wasn't one of the primary things. So that's what we're going to see when we get into Amos. Now... We're in chapter 3. We read some of the other things last week, so we're going to skip down to verse 13 and pick it up here. He's talking, but keep in mind, this is what his attitude is. I've chosen you 
Therefore, I'm going to respond to your actions. You are mine. I will punish you for your sins. So in verse 13, he says, Hear this and testify against the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. One of the reasons why I started, this started here is, see that phrase, the Lord God Almighty, or the Lord God of armies, or the Lord God of hosts, whichever, whichever way your translation is. That's the first time Amos uses that, but he's going to start using it a lot. The Lord God who has the power, has the armies, has the capacity to bring a lot of destruction. The Lord God Almighty. And then he says in verse 14, On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. So he starts off by saying, remember he's preaching to the, to the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was, that's where the temple was, and that's where God said, that's where I want you to worship. But the northern kingdom, they didn't want to come down and mingle with the other southern southerners. We could use northerners and southerners because that's kind of, we kind of relate, can relate to that. We don't, if we were told that in order to worship God right then, we had to go down to, say, Sacramento, People in Oregon would say, we're not going down to Sacramento. That's in, that's in California, God. We don't go there. But that's kind of the attitude the Northerners had. So what they did is they set up their own um, their own uh, place to worship. It was in a place called Bethel or Bethel. Uh, I like to pronounce it Bethel because the word Beth in uh, Hebrew stands for house. And the word El is the name for God. So Bethel means the house of God, or God's house. But it wasn't. It was called that, but it wasn't. And so he starts off by saying, I will destroy that temple, that place. That's what he says to Israel. Now you have to see why. So we're going to turn to 1 Kings 12. Keep your finger there, because we're going to come back there. But 1 Kings 12, verse... 26. And I thought about doing a whole bunch of stuff about all this, but this is about 200 years before Amos was. And in 1 Kings 12, starting in verse 26, the first word there is, in the NIV here, is Jeroboam. Now, you guys remember who Jeroboam is? Even if you did, you wouldn't be getting the right Jeroboam, because there's two of them. <laughs> There's actually a Jeroboam who's king of Israel when Amos is preaching. If you go back to verse 1 of the chapter of Amos, it's Jeroboam is the king there. That's Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the first, which we're going to be reading about, is the guy that led the rebellion that divided the kingdoms. He's the one who rebelled against Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son. So you guys, you got to remember, you gotta, are you not writing down these names? Because they're going to be on the test. And you're going to have to figure out these. No, Jared, just know that what we're reading here is a division. If this is where the two sides divided, Judah and the northern kingdom, Jeroboam. So Jeroboam thought to himself, he, he set up his kingdom, right? He's, the, he's rebelled against the, the Lion of David and he set up this northern kingdom. And he says, and he thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. He says, I've got to be careful here because if I go back, I won't be able to keep my kingdom. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem even though it's only a couple, like 30 miles away. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan. Dan is way in the north, way up as far north as you can go in Israel. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. So when God says, I will destroy your altar in Bethel, this is what he's talking about. For 200 years, the northern kingdom of Israel has been worshiping there, even though God said, 
that's not me. That's not who I am. But go back to Amos. And in verse uh, 14 again, he says, On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. The horns are where you put the blood of the sacrifice. Horns also represent the strength of something. So if you cut the horns off, you're taking away their strength. So the first sin of Israel, the first thing that we talk about when we talk about worship, then, is that religious activity with the wrong object of worship. Remember what Jeroboam did? He put a golden calf up there. He said, this is your God. And God says, that's not me. That's not me. You're not worshiping me. You're worshiping something or someone else. That's not me. So when you come to worship, and we come here together, you have to ask yourself, well, who is it that I'm worshiping? Who am I choosing to worship? Who am I thinking about? I think I say this a lot, and sometimes I think I'm repeating myself, and then I think, well, you guys don't remember what I say anyway, so I can just keep saying the same thing over and over. But the most important thing about you at this moment is what you think about when you think about God. Who is your God? Who is the person you came here to worship today? A lot of times we come to worship for other reasons, so I can get something. And God says, oh, you come to worship to worship me, to, to think about me, to think about who I am and what I do. That's why you come to worship. And that's what Amos is saying to these people. I have to punish you because when you come to worship, you're not worshiping me. You're not doing, you're not, uh, you're not coming here because of me. You don't love me. You love something, someone else, and you're using this time to worship that thing rather than me. Worship is a reflection of who we think, of what we think about. John, um, this, uh, this, in, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 4, is the famous story where Jesus is sitting at a well and he meets this uh, Samaritan woman. And the, the, the connection is, of course, is that where is the capital of the northern kingdom? The town is called Samaria. So this is a woman who has grown up in the northern kingdom, the northern part. And she's talking to Jesus, and in verse 19, she says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. I always like it when people say that to me. Sir, I can see that you're a Bible teacher. I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. She's talking about Bethel and uh, the other ones that Amos was talking about. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the, in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father sees. Spirit and truth. It's got to be real truth, but there's also a spiritual component to it. If you're here just for truth, then you're missing the point. If you're here just to kind of connect to some kind of spiritual thing, you're missing the point. There is a reality to all of this that we're supposed to be doing. And Amos is saying to Amos is saying to his people, you're not loving God when you worship. You're loving something else. You're not here for the right reasons. You're here for the wrong reasons. For the wrong person, really. Because you could probably worship. This is why sometimes when people say, I'm going to be prophetic here a little bit, kind of pick on people. Not, nobody here, of course, it's other people. But just the idea about when people say, well, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious. What that means is, you don't really know what, who or what you're worshiping. You just want to have a good spiritual kind of feeling. But Jesus says, 
no, there's got to be truth involved here. There's got to be, you got to be thinking about this specific person, this God, this, the God of the Jews, not some other random, a golden calf or something. And this is what Amos is talking about. This is what Jesus is talking about as he preaches these things. Back in Amos, going on in verse 15, because we're going to, we're talking about some religious people. Now we're going to talk about rich people. Is that okay if I talk about rich people? <laughs> it doesn't matter because I'm going to do it anyway. So in verse 15, he says, it, he goes right on and says, I will tear down, the eye there is God. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. Oh no, it's going to get both my houses, right? How many of you have two houses? <laughs> oh, somebody does, yeah. Uh, what about more? The house, the, 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 there, that's right. Here comes the next one. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed, and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. He's talking about rich people now. You know why? Because for almost all of us, the biggest God that's in competition with the real God is money. It really is. We think about money lots more than we think about God. Right? Right? Well, it, it's, uh, it's part of the, that the reality is even, pe even poor people think about money more often than they think about God. It, it's not a matter of how much you have. It's the fact that money, that's what Jesus points out when, it is, and when he's preaching. You can, you can only serve one master. You can't serve both God and money. You can't. Either way. But it just goes on because um, Amos is a politically correct, is not very politically, I should say he's not very politically correct. So in verse, he goes on in the next verse to say, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. It is, cows. Cows. Oh. <laughs> then he's, the next line says, you women. So when he says cows, who's he talking about? <laughs> See, there's a, there's a parallelism between the sentences. So when he says, you cows, and then he says, you women, and then he says, this is, the, this is why I'm calling you cows. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. And say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. That's kind of an interesting little, um, let me read a little bit more. The sovereign Lord <laughs> has sworn by his holiness the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through the breaches in the wall, and you will be cast out towards Harmon, declares the Lord. You ask yourself, well, that's kind of an odd little picture, right? Um, not, the, the hook thing is interesting because historically, the, the nation that's going to come into Israel after Amos preaches is, is called Assyria. And Assyria is a really, they're, they're really violent, terrible people. They really are. And one of the things that they would do when they have their hook, the captives, you know, today you, you think of captives that kind of chained together with maybe around the wrist or around the ankle or something. But that's not what the Assyrians did. What the Assyrians did is they would put a hook in people. I mean, literally, into their skin. And that's how they would connect them together. So when he says, you will be taken away with hooks, that's what he's talking about. These, these people are going to put these hooks in your, maybe in your face, put in your hand. Why, why do you handcuffs if you can just hook people together? <laughs> the Syrians are really terrible. When I say they're terrible people, I'm saying they're terrible people. Believe me. But he says the reason this is happening is, it's not just because you're worshiping the wrong person. He says the problem is, is that you're oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. This part about, say to your husbands, bring us some drinks, is really just a way of saying, everybody should serve me. You should take care of me. It's all about me and my needs and my wants in this case. And I want everybody to know that. If I have money particularly, I think everybody else is here to make my life better. Nobody in here thinks that. I know. I'm not looking at it. I always said that I shouldn't preach up there. That way I'm not looking at anybody. But that's what he's saying. This, you come to worship at Beth, even at Bethel, but even at Jerusalem. But all week long, you spent all that week insisting that other things happen for your good. 
for my good, for me, the selfishness that's there. And this is that part that I talk about when I say Amos is looking at the great commandment. Love the Lord God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what Amos says. Are, is that what this looks like? Oppress the needy, crush, or crush the needy, oppress the poor. Everybody serve me. So, the sins of Israel. One is a religious activity, but wrong object of worship. The second is religious activity without righteous behavior. You think that you can just come to church on Sunday and then the rest of the week do whatever you want. And God says, no. Worship me means that you're doing it every day by how you live, the choices you make, the things that you do, the, the attitudes that you have towards other people and other things. And a lot of times we do these things honestly without really even thinking about it. We, don't, we, just, we just do things because this is the way everybody else acts. But we are supposed to be different. And God expects those he has chosen to be different. Because he will act towards us if we don't. In Revelation, uh, just because I, I keep saying this, I keep saying this because I keep saying this, and I keep saying this all the time because I feel like I'm repeating myself. But sometimes people do think, well, yeah, but that was in Israel a long time ago. That didn't happen. That doesn't happen now. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. This is the letter to the church in Laodicea. This is a letter written in Revelation to Christians. Any Christians in here? Amen. Well, I was, that, now the hands go up everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we want to be Christians, absolutely. This is what he says to the church. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, except for other people to serve me. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Yeah. Come to church, we may be dressed in nice clothes, we might have nice houses, we might think that we have it all, but God says, But when you come here, you bring that attitude, and you're missing the point. You're missing your one thing is that you're just blind to all the things that you're doing through the week, how you're treating other people, what you allow to keep going on, the things that happen every day. But we come to church and we sing our songs and we listen to the, the tremendous preaching that you hear every Sunday. And then we think we're all right. And God says, no, worship is as much about the, it's about the object, love the Lord your God. But it's also about, are we really loving our neighbor? Are we living out what we say God wants us to do? That's, the, that's a critical thing for us. And he's, and he's very, like I said, he's politically correct. He does. He, just, he uses nice terms to everybody. He doesn't want to offend anybody. No, you can't be a preacher without offending some people. That's a, that's a truism. Take my word for it. Okay? <laughs> Back to Amos chapter 4 now, in verse 4. And he says, he's talking still to those in the northern kingdom. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. You go to church. You go to do all the, give a lot of money, you do all the, the sacrifices, you follow all the rituals, you, you pray the Lord's Prayer. Some of you are, you know, you, you, we do the Lord's Prayer and you want to make sure that you say it loud. Why? Because you want the people around you to hear you saying the Lord's Prayer, right? No, nobody here. I mean, like I said, nobody here. I'm preaching really to the choir here because nobody here does those. But sometimes you do that. You just want people to see you in church. You want people to think well of you. So you, now, I'm not going to say you anymore. 
You guys are gifted. <laughs> right? right? People come to church to be seen by other people. Kind of like the joke that I said earlier. We really come to see or be seen. And God says, that's not the, what I'm talking about. If you do that, you are going, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, but it says go to Bethel and sin. But we could say go to church and sin. Go to Bible study and sin yet more. Because we're not doing those things for the right reasons. We're not doing it to worship God. We're not doing it because we want to learn how to be a better person and love our neighbor better. We're doing it for some other reason. And one reason can be because we want other people to see us. Aren't I special? I'm a good churchgoer. I really do feel like that. So the sins of Israel, the third one is religious activity uh, is, a, is a sin when it tries to attract attention to me. And, and this is kind of where I guess I'm going to say this is where I really have to watch out for it instead. You should pray for me. Because it's easy. Because you notice the one person who's up here by himself with everybody looking at him? <laughs> so I tell a good joke, everybody laughs, and I feel good because everybody thinks I'm a funny guy and, he's, and he just enjoys the sermon. And, well, but it's easy to come to church and just do it so that other people will see it. Other people will see it. Matthew 6, where Jesus addressed that, said that, that line about, for this is what you love to do, it says. You love to do that, not love God and love my neighbor. I just love it when other people notice me at church. So in Matthew chapter 6, and some of you probably already know what I'm going to read before I read it. Matthew 6, verse 1 says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Be careful not to practice your religious activities in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Sometimes I, I worry about that. Because I stand up here and I've done twice already. Pray. And, and, and I have to think about this sometimes and pray about it a lot and say, God, please help me to be talking to you when I'm praying and not to them. I'm just talking to you, God. The fact that they're listening is beside the point. Help me to just pray. And I'm telling you, it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's, and it's something that Jesus says, well, don't do that. So in fact, there are some uh, groups of Christians that don't pray in public at all because of this. That's going too far. I don't think that's necessary. But it is something that you can pray for me. Pray that your pastor would be talking to God and that he would be preaching God's word. Not for his own, not so that you will listen to me, not so that you will hear what my word or think well of me. I appreciate it when you do, and I'm not going to complain when you do, but not to do those things for those reasons. Praying to God. Preaching God's word like Amos. And I need to keep doing that. Because it's easy to become a hypocrite like that. I'm telling you, I'm firmly convinced that the biggest danger that we all face is that we will become Pharisees. That's the biggest danger we face. It's bigger even than a lot of times any, you know, falling into sin. That happens. But the biggest problem across the board for all Christians is that we will be like this. We will be Pharisees. We need to take that seriously. Amos, one more time. This is the 
I, the reason why I read that first verse about, in, back in chapter 3, about, uh, you only have my chosen of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your sins. Here in verse 6, he's going to pick up on that. This is Amos chapter 4 again, back in verse 6. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. One of the styles of Amos is he likes this repetition where he says something and then he says it again or says something else, but he keeps coming back in that line. Yet you have not returned to me is going to be repeated six times in the next six verses. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and it dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me declares the Lord. God says, I'm doing all of these things not to, not, not to take you, uh, not to hurt you, but so that you will realize what you're doing and return to me. That you will come back to loving your God and loving your neighbor. That you will change the way you're doing things. That's why God says, I'm doing this. That's always God's goal. Whatever happens in our life, God is always seeking to make, he's, he's trying to get us to put our attention on God, to think about God. I um, have a series of questions here that kind of define who, our, who we think our God is or who do we worship, right? So who do you turn to when you are troubled? That's kind of the main theme of this passage. Who do you turn to when you have problems? God. Yes. Supposed to be. Yes. But I might turn to my money, or turn to my family, or turn to friend, or whatever. But who do, you, who do you turn to? That's the question you have to answer. Who do you thank when you're blessed? This passage isn't talking about it, but other passages in the Bible say sometimes that's what God does. He blesses us. Why? Because He wants us to turn to Him. And we're supposed to thank Him when things go well. Sometimes people do that. I mean, sometimes people do one of those, but not both. When things are going good, I'll bless God. I'll love God, but you bring some problems into my life and I'm walking away. Some people are the opposite. When things are bad, they don't come to God. God, please help me. Fix my problems. Fix. Then once the problems are fixed, what do they do? They go away. Because they're, and, and that's always the danger we always have in all of these, is that we'll be on one side or the other. Every one of us has a problem on one direction or the other. Who do you seek to please? Who is the person that you want to, you want to be happy with you more than anything else or anyone else? And then I'm going to ask, who are you thinking about right now? You know, <laughs> this is funny for me, but it's funny because I think of it, but you know what some of you are thinking right now? I can guarantee you, you're thinking, I really wish my kids could hear this right now. <laughs> I really think my neighbor, I really wish my neighbor was hearing this right now, because they really need to hear this. You know, there's a little story, I'm not going to look it up, but there's a little story in Luke where um, the Pharisee and a tax collector are praying at the same time. And the Pharisee is praying supposedly to God. And the tax collector right next to him is just pouring out his heart. I, forgive me for a sinner. Thank you for forgiving me. Confessing his sins. And the Pharisee says, praise. Thank you, God, that I'm not like you. Know. And then the little story goes, and then there was the pastor who read that and then said to his people, thank you, God, that we're not like that Pharisee. 
Always think, who am I thinking about when I'm hearing all this stuff? Am I thinking about my am I thinking about my own attitude? Am I thinking about what do I do when I come to worship? Or am I thinking about, well, you know, there's those other people, they really should hear this. No, we need to hear it. I need to hear it. You need to hear it. Amen. Who are you thinking about right now? And here's who you should be thinking about. Back to Amos, verse 12. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. Wow, that could be either the scariest thing ever or the best thing ever, right? It could be one or the other. And then he defines, he says, He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, that's an, the word wind there is also can be translated as breath or spirit. He who creates your breath, your spirit, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness, treads and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. That's who we should come to worship, prepared to meet. The God who does that creates, who sustains, who provides, who punishes, who judges, who does all of these things. That's the God we come to worship. And that is who we should always be focused on when we come to church. There's a preacher named Vance Havner a few generations ago, but he had a lot of these uh, kind of pithy ways of saying things. And he said this, God places high value on holiness, reverence, and worship. He approved neither idol worship, who you worship, or idol worship, coming without any worship, but ideal worship in spirit and truth. Who are you worshiping? Is your worship accomplishing anything in your life? Are you living differently? Religious activity is good as long as we're not doing anything. That's the key thing about worship. It was true in Amos' time. It's true in our time. Mm -hmm. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Yes. Father, I, uh, I thank you for being our God. And I thank you for being patient with us. God, to be honest, I do come to church wrong, with wrong attitudes many times. And I ask you to forgive me for that. I ask you to forgive us for that, God. When we don't worship you, when we don't live our lives the way we should, to come prepared to worship. When we just turn all the focus upon ourselves. So God, forgive us. And we recognize that this is why you sent your son. Because we needed your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. So Father, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for doing what you have done. And everything that you continue to do in our lives. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are reminded of God's grace. And God